Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Investors Bank, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Verizon Communications, the law firm of Gibbons PC. NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 college savings plan. Turn a dream into a degree. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. And by Cone Resnick, Accounting Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by Politicker NJ. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We are going to be talking about asthma with our good friend uh, Jonathan Pearson, who is the executive director of the Horizon Foundation of New Jersey. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, Steve. Let's uh, get a couple things out about asthma. Um, it's a disorder that causes the airways of the lungs to swell and narrow. Asthma is one of the most common recurring childhood illnesses. Correct. Correct. 300,000 children or more in New Jersey have been diagnosed with it. Yes, correct. Why is it such a big issue for Horizon? What are you doing about it? Well, through our foundation, we created a BEAM program. It's our signature asthma initiative. BEAM, B-E-A-M. BEAM, B-E-A-M, Breathe Easier with Asthma Management. Go ahead. And what we did is we, we looked at asthma as a, as a major um, prevalent disease impacting children. And we're focusing on kids 5 to 18. Um, and we looked at the data in terms of the most prevalence of asthma in New Jersey. And we also wanted to identify where those kids were, but also identify a partner uh, to help us deliver a program. So the Boys and Girls Clubs in New Jersey are good friends. They're our partner. They're delivering this BEAM program to 2,500 children, again, ages 5 to 18, in nine counties with the highest prevalence of asthma. So 2,500 children, their parents, their caregivers, uh, this program's going on. It's a pilot initiative. We invested over half a million dollars to create the BEAM program. Take a step back. Is it fair to say that asthma disproportionately affects children in inner cities? Well, when you look at the data, it's interesting because uh, you would think that urban settings, you know, yeah. high pollution and other factors, but um, even in, in rural settings, the agriculture runoff and other things. Uh, so, so the rates are high, not only in urban settings, but also in, uh, in rural and kind of suburban settings. And in New Jersey, there's nine counties that have the highest prevalence. So a county like Gloucester County, which you may not think has high so that's rates, a rural county? And, and, that's, and that's one of them. So, um, you know, you look at counties like Atlanta County and others, uh, as well as Essex here in um, the northern part of the state, sure. very high rates of asthma. Talk about the Boys and Girls Clubs, who we have a very close relationship with as well. They do wonderful work. What exactly is the program? Describe what goes on in an effort to deal with asthma for these children. So, you know, they, they impact about 75,000 youth every day. And they're a great partner. They have great infrastructure. And the children that they are um, working with day in and day out uh, are the folks that we want to get to, their parents, their caregivers, and those children. And through the American Lung Association, there's curriculum that they're using through this grant uh, to raise awareness around asthma, uh, to identify it in their population. Um, you know, kids that are, that are coughing, wheezing, other symptoms, other triggers of asthma, when those um, instructors at the Boys and Girls Club are evaluating their, their, uh, their kids in their program, if they may see a child that may have uh, some symptom of asthma, there's a referral process uh, to a physician for follow-up treatment uh, to manage the disease. But because we know it's not preventable. You, Hold you on, cannot... back up. Sure. Because that's I know a lot of people watching us are, are wondering, is asthma preventable? The answer is no. It's no. It's, is it treatable? It's treatable. Describe and it's, that. And the, the prevention piece is around the asthma attacks. So asthma attacks are preventable through management. So if you can manage the condition, children can have a very good quality of life and lead a very healthy lifestyle. So um, it ties back to healthcare costs as well. And when you look at the emergency room visits triggered by asthma, 
The latest data here in New Jersey from the, from the uh, Department of Health and CDC, over 53,000 ER visits because of asthma attacks. And most of those attacks are preventable. Um, again, you need to know the symptoms and understand how you treat the we'll asthma attack. back up for attack. a second again. So 53,000 53, visits over a year? In one year. In, into the emergency rooms related to asthma? Yes. Okay, so what exactly is preventable that would cause a child not to go to the emergency room because he or she has asthma? And what would happen to that child otherwise? Well, you know, when you, when you look at how you manage asthma, you need to look at those, those triggers and, and the symptoms of them. So if, if children are, are, are wheezing or breathing heavy, um, there's, there's medication. Is the idea to act quickly? Act quickly, and there's medication, inhalers, and other things to manage it and to kind of settle it down. Because, the, the, as you know, the asthma attack, the, the lungs uh, swell and, and narrow, so your breathing is compromised. So if you're not educated on how to really treat the, the attack, you're running to the ER. You know, I'm a parent of three children. In the middle of the night, what's the first thing you're going to think of doing? You're going to the you're ER. Go to the ER. Especially so. if you're not, it's interesting because, John, if you're not, Jonathan, if you're not treating the asthma and it's getting worse, if you don't know what to do when it happens and it's getting worse, you're going to the emergency room. Absolutely. But so, if you're, so the national, ahead, national figure, Steve, so in New Jersey, it's about 53,000. And once they come in through the ER, then there's the, you know, about 16,000 uh, inpatient stays from that. So you come in through ER, get treated. Talk about cost. And, and then at the national level, it's 600,000 ER visits. And the cost is about 300 million annually. So I know we're concentrating on New Jersey as a New Jersey company, New Jersey Foundation. But it's but a national issue. It's a national issue, and, and the costs are, are um, astronomical. Real quick, why does the Horizon Foundation... I know you, and, and I don't have to say full disclosure, because if you go on our website, you'll see the, the Horizon is an underwriter of public broadcasting and supports what we do. And you see they support nightly news, uh, um, NJTV News every night as well. But why, why this kind of initiative? Well, again, it goes back to 300,000 children. We want to raise the awareness of asthma, right? We want to heighten the awareness, educate parents, educate caregivers, um, get to the youth that, that may be uh, suffering from asthma. But is that part of the mission? Help me understand that. Absolutely. Part of our mission is to support organizations that make New Jersey healthier. So at the end of the day, we want everyone to be healthier, lead a healthier lifestyle. Uh, it ties to the promise of our company to enrich the lives of the communities and members that we serve. So it, it's, it's clearly um, tied directly to the work of the foundation uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and children... Uh, are, are key part of that. You know, we want to make sure these, these children grow up healthy mm. uh, and lead a healthier lifestyle overall. And I happen to know, because I've, I've uh, done some leadership work there at Horizon, uh, some coaching and training, that you've talked about the fact in 2015 there are three areas you're going to be focusing on in the foundation. What are they again? So our foundation, our, our mission is to support organizations that make New Jersey healthier. Our tagline is healthier together. And we have new, uh, new pillars of, uh, of giving. So we have a caring pillar, all around disease prevention and management, which includes asthma, diabetes, obesity, and oral health. And then we have a connecting pillar, which is all around health literacy, providing plain language and culturally appropriate language. Things around like comparable health, uh, health information uh, and, and cost of services and, and the role of a provider and institution. And then we have a creating pillar that's all around arts and culture, promoting health through arts mm -hmm. and culture. So those are our three pillars, caring, connecting, and creating, uh, under the umbrella of our, our new foundation strategy. Um, what would you say the number one leadership lesson you have learned in all of your work um, heading up the foundation and just as an executive, number one leadership lesson is? To me, it's listening. Uh, listening to individuals, um, leaders, listening to my team and others, uh, understanding what, what's going on in the communities that we serve. So absorbing all of that. It also helps when you do this job as well. Uh, Jonathan Pearson, who's executive director of the Horizon Foundation in New Jersey, appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, there, right there. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you, John. Thank you. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. 
everything you've ever wanted or needed to know about higher education. You're about to find out with our good friend, Dr. Kay Walter, president of Bergen Community College. Good to see you, Kay. Good to see you, Steve. Let's talk about um, the fact that we just had an interesting discussion. We're here in our studio, and we're able to talk to you and uh, three other college presidents who represent very different institutions. But the issue of cost generated a, a fascinating debate. You're concerned, aren't you? I'm extremely concerned uh, because we serve a student population that doesn't have money to go to college. These are not rich kids who just can have money to burn. These are kids who come from families where their parents work two, three, sometimes four jobs all the time right. just to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. So when a, when a kid, not even a kid, any person of any age, a student, starts to build up that kind of debt, right? Um, what kind of impact does it have in terms of not just the academic, the college experience, but the potential that that student just doesn't hang in and quits? If you look at your debt level and you see yourself building more and more debt and you know that you, the job that you get when you finish college it's not going to pay that debt off in any time period. Sure. You're going to start feeling frustrated and quit. That's why uh, we are trying really hard to build our foundation right now, more and more scholarships so that students don't have to take out loans. So they're e either able to go to college on, with financial aid right. or with a scholarship from our foundation because we are very concerned about the debt level of our students. But the other part of that that's important is you mentioned, you know, the whole idea of I'm here to learn, but I'm also here to increase the odds that I'll be able to compete in a very competitive job market, you know? Talk about the internships that you offer on your campus and its direct connection to increasing the odds that a student could be employed in the marketplace. I'll give you a, a really good example of an internship program that we have just started with Hackensack Medical Center, um, the John Thayer Cancer Center, right. to be exact. We started working this past year with um, three very bright physicians, Dr. Goldless, Dr. Singer, and Dr. Captan, who are neuro-oncologists and neurosurgeons. And they really need uh, databases built. And we have technology students who can build databases. So we've developed internship programs with them and are in the process uh, down the road of build, building databases for them. What does it do for them? I and mean, First of all, the students are building a database for the physicians as it relates to their it patients will, and the patient is information. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It will allow them to really... Uh, take a look at the research that they're doing on all of the new kinds of drug therapies uh, and different uh, protocol for treating brain cancer. So it's, it's really um, an honor for us to be partnering with them. Not only are they providing internships for our students, but they also have been coming to campus and giving lectures for our students. The physicians? The physicians. What does that do for the students? Uh, the students call them their rock stars. Wow. Uh, these are students who want to be physicians, who want uh, to be business people and work in the medical professions. They see this as an opportunity to connect with the work that they're going to be doing in the future. It's a big part of... Uh... Bergen Community College, as I've learned more and more about your campus, the whole idea of partnering, partnerships. You have a relationship, is, was it, is it with Bergen Votech? It's with Bergen Technical School. What, what is that about, and why, how does that impact your students in a positive way? We talked earlier today about finances. With the college presidents, right. With the college presidents, and you and I talked a little bit about it as we started this discussion. One of the things that our community colleges can do is partner with our technical schools, which we've done for a new applied technology degree. Applied technology, technology degree. degree. Go ahead. So we're going to have an early college class beginning in 2015 on our campus that will be students from the technology high school. They will be our students and their students at the same time. 
When they finish their high school degree in four years, they will have also finished their first year of college. Our faculty and their faculty will be co-teaching classes together and supporting these students so that financially they're going to have a year of college paid for when they finish and they'll only have a year left to go to finish their uh, associate's degree. Case, it come down to the fact that, that college, whether it's a two-year institution or a four-year institution, that the entire college experience at your place and others, particularly at your place for this conversation, requires that an institution of higher learning goes outside of its walls and partners with healthcare systems like you described at Hackensack or uh, Bergen, Votech, and obviously others, that you can't just say it's all here on campus. It doesn't work that way. That's, Steve, why we have the name community in our name. We are a community college, and we partner with uh, our community businesses, our community K-12 through partners, and our university partners, so that everyone has access to an education in the most affordable and successful way. Final topic. Um, the whole question of readiness, student readiness, we also talked about in that College Presidents Roundtable. I want to uh, delve into this a little bit more in the time we have with you. Why is it that so many students enter college so ill-prepared or just simply not prepared to do what they have to do to forget about compete, survive? We're finding that most of our first-generation students are not prepared to transition into college. As long as we give them preparation, and we've begun our new summer intensive program with our students, we prepare them to leave high school and to be ready uh, to enter college-level courses. So first, the whole question is they're coming from high school into Bergen and then from Bergen to a four-year school. Go ahead, play it out. So when they finish high school, if they're at risk, we put them in our summer intensive program. We do... What do you do with them? We do all sorts of things. We have volunteers from the community again who come in and assist us. We have mentors for the students. We teach them study skills. We prepare them to take placement tests. Uh, we teach them about how they learn, whether uh, they're an auditory learner, uh, whether they like kinesthesis, whether they would prefer just to take an online class and be happy doing that. You actually, it sounds like they're survival skills for higher education. Well, of course there are. There's sur survival skills for every college And there's student. no reason to assume that, that a person can just enter in and succeed. They need, we need help. We all need help. Dr. Kay Walter, president of uh, Bergen Community College, one of the 19 community colleges in the state. Kay, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you, Kay. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Frank Moore, board-certified neurosurgeon at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Thanks for having me. Um, spine surgery. Your approach to it is, uh, first of all, what kind of spine surgery do you do? And then let's talk about your approach to it, which is very interesting, unique, and effective. Go ahead. Well, we do spine surgery on all parts of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. And uh, although we're able to do spine surgery the same way as orthopedic surgeons do it, as neurosurgeons, it's been told that we approach the problem from the nerves outward, and the orthopedic people are more trained to deal from the bone towards the nerve. So we have a slightly different approach to the So issue. it's so interesting. People will say, uh, I've said this on another show, because when I had this laminectomy down my lumbar, someone said, well, so you had that from an orthopedic surgeon? I said, nope, it was from a neurosurgeon. And so they said, well, it doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference, doesn't it? I think it does. First of all, uh, the neurosurgeons spend a lot more time during training dealing with nerves on a regular basis. And the most crucial part of the surgery is to protect the nerves. So it makes sense to have someone who's got a very good understanding of the nervous structure 
to have it done. So when you have the sciatica problem going all the way down your leg from the nerve problem in your back, the neurosurgeon has a really good understanding as to why that's happening. Surely does. I'm not saying that the orthopedics don't have it either, and the ones that are well trained will be excellent spine surgeons, but the majority of neurosurgeons know how to deal with nerves on a regular basis. Now, you have this team approach, a partner. Describe yes, we this. do. What we do in our practice is every case has two senior surgeons on the case. Imagine a pilot and a co-pilot on every, on every flight. And the reason we do that is it cuts down the operating time. You've got four hands. We know each other very well. It's a bit like a ballet, if you would. And uh, it cuts down the operating time. It cuts down the bleeding, cuts down Back anesthesia up. Why time. bleeding? Bleeding from surgery comes from the length of the surgery because the muscles will ooze a little bit or there will be bleeding from a vein. If you can cut down the time, there will be less blood loss. At Englewood Hospital, we're actually what is called a bloodless hospital. And people come to us from all over the country, from all over the world actually, to have this bloodless surgery. We have a big program of Jehovah Witness people who come and have surgery at Englewood. Also talk about this. When you work in a team like this in tandem, less blood, again, the four hands that you talked about, does it have an impact on the recovery? It does. The shorter the operative time, the faster you're going to be able to recover. You'll have less anesthesia in the body, but also when we do surgery, you have to retract the muscles. If you can retract them 30% less, it'll be that much faster for you to recover. And finally, as far as surgery, during the surgery, if there's a little moment of hesitation, you can debate and discuss it immediately with your colleague, mm -hmm. and you know you're gonna get a good answer. But I'm curious about this. I'm gonna ask you about people's apprehension about spine surgery overall in a second, but I'm curious about this. What you're saying makes sense on paper, logically, but I also have to believe that the individual surgeons and how they interact with each other is a huge part of this because I also have to believe that egos or lack of and the, the ability to truly be a team is a huge part of this. Am it I is. making too much of that? No, I think you're absolutely right. And that's why you, know, you call this a partnership. I mean, at the end of the day, we want the best possible result for our patients and we're not fighting it against Did each other. Did you pick each other? We, we, we did, did eventually. Did find we, each other? What happened? We have five people now, and uh, it's been, you know, it's, a, it's like a courtship. You figure out who's good, who's <laughs> not, and eventually uh, you end up working together. And you see the results? The results are great, yes. So let's talk about uh, people's, many people who have apprehension. I'm never, I'm never, I'm never going to let anybody touch my back. No one's going to touch my spine. Yeah, that's quite, quite understandable because for the longest time, Surgical techniques were really not that great, not that well developed, and uh, the results were not that great. And so people became very apprehensive and they would leave spine surgery as the last resort. The issue is that if you can take care of the surgery a little earlier on in the process, you're going to get much better results. Imagine your car is running and you get a little red alarm on the dashboard telling you that something's wrong. If you fix it right there and then, it'll be a much better result than if you wait till the whole engine blows up. And that's often the kind of patients we get, people who have such bad backaches or such bad problems that by the time we get to them, it's a lot more difficult to get satisfactory results. Talk about the difference between someone who comes to you and, because there are patients who come to you and you say, no, I'm not gonna operate. Correct. Under what circumstance? I know every case is different, but. Right. You know, at the end of the day, we obviously get a, a thorough history, a physical exam. And for a lot of us in our partnership, we've done so many cases that you do get a gestalt. You get an understanding of what the patient has gone through. And you look, obviously, at all the radiological studies, and you make a, a customized decision on each patient. You kind of realize some people probably should never have surgery. There's other issues going at hand, and if you're smart enough to pick that up, then you just tell them that there are other modalities, they should continue with physical therapy, this mm -hmm. or that. And other people, you realize they can do physical therapy or get injected in their spine. Nothing's going to make a big difference because the problem is so mechanical, it needs a mechanical solution, and that means surgery. Very personal. 
Uh, real quick, I'm going to ask you about leadership in a second because I'm very curious about your sure. approach. I'm going to ask you actually right now because you've done the Ironman. Yes. Uh, triathlon. You also play soccer. Uh, found out that you played yes. soccer with our uh, floor manager, Terry, um, in New York. Greatest leadership lesson you've learned, particularly in that operating room, is? As far as I'm concerned, in the operating room, there are a lot of people involved. And I find that the biggest lesson I've learned is to, to really listen to the opinion of the people on my team. And you were talking about ego, not try to think, hey, here I am, the big honcho guy, and I know everything, but really listen to my nurse anesthetist if she's concerned about the positioning of the patient and not just forget about it. And we had a case not long ago, we, we listened to her, and sure enough, it may have made a big difference at the end. So listening to these team members is super important. One minute left. I know there was a patient that you worked on, I believe she was a female athlete? Yes. Real quick, one minute, explain that. This was a woman who came to me. She had had surgery before. Surgery had failed, unfortunately. She was still complaining of severe back pain. She was an avid runner. And eventually, we took her back to surgery, fixed what had to be done. And it was really comforting to see a few months later, I would say 18 months later, she sent me a selfie of herself doing the marathon in New York City, saying, hey, Dr. Moore, here I am running the, the streets of New York. Thank you very much. So these are great stories. It also means that the first surgery that you do is the most important one. That's the one where you're going to get the best results. Pretty rewarding, huh? It is. Yeah. Dr. Warner, thank you for uh, making sense of spine surgery and putting it in perspective. And um, it's, you did an important public service. So thank I want to thank you. I appreciate thank you. it. Um, people need to ask the right questions of their doctor. Thank you, doctor. You're very welcome. The great. preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Investors Bank, PSE&G, Verizon Communications, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Cone Resnick. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. First steps, first day of school, first game. When their first day of college arrives, will you be able to pay for it? NJ Best can help. It is the 529 college savings plan for New Jersey families, and you can start saving today with as little as $25. To learn about NJ Best 529 college savings plan, its investment objectives, risks, and costs, read the investor handbook available at 877-755-GRAD or njbest.com.